In this episode, People Power. We look at the communities hoping to lead a worldwide microenergy revolution. Tanya takes us on a very special eco-tour of Ireland's most unique protected environmental habitats. But first, we visit Austria and see an alpine town in Carinthia that pioneered clean renewable energy and cut 80,000 euros a day from their fuel bill. In the last 10 years, a small town in Austria has drawn attention from all over Europe by striking out for energy independence and succeeding beyond their wildest dreams. Kochach, in the Upper Alps, has breathtaking scenery that draws in tourists for walking, cycling and skiing in winter. But being so remote, it has downsides too, and it meant they were extremely dependent on imports of oil and gas. The town seemed trapped and tied to farming as the only other driver for the local economy. But a 19th century hydropower got the town thinking about an alternative energy future, and today they have much to celebrate. Christoph, is this outfit now traditional to this area of Kretschow? Yes, Kretschow. We are wearing leather trousers, or we say in German lederhosen, and it's a nice way of uh, having, you see, this festival below, and we are not always wearing these uh, leather trousers, but sometimes. Right, so a huge change has happened so far. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happened? The, the first part was this electricity site. 21 small hydropower stations were created in this beautiful area. Using the lakes for hydropower fueled their ambitions to take further action. They built wind turbines in the mountain passes, installed solar PV panels to back up their green credentials, and then turned their attention to finding alternatives to oil for their heating needs. The answer was on their doorstep in the form of biomass from their local forests. Creating district heating run on locally supplied fuels meant farmers became energy suppliers and kept local cash circulating in the community instead of disappearing back down the oil pipelines and out of the country forever. More than five district heating systems are existing now in Kötzschach Mountain. And what fuel is firing that? Biomass. Biomass, all Biomass. wood from the mountains here. All wood from the mountains and really from our mountains. So what percentage of all of your heating now is from biomass? Uh, the biomass heating now has reached more than 70%. Right, that's huge. That's Nearly huge. two thirds of all your heating energy is from wood. Yeah. That's incredibly good. And what about electricity? How much power are you generating here for your own self sufficiency? Three times the, the demand of uh, Kötzschach Mountain we can produce now here, nowadays. So 340% is produced in Kötzschach Mountain by small hydropower, then uh, by a wind power station at the, uh, at the pass to Italy. In the last 10 years, energy independent regions are growing like mushrooms in Austria, demonstrating that this grassroots strategy has been the key to success. From Carinthia to Lower Austria and from Salzburg to Styria, more than 15 regions are now energy independent. So when you look at all of the benefits of reducing your energy and all of you're doing and the tourism benefits and all, you must have brought down your greenhouse gas emissions quite a lot. The normal CO2 emission was um, eight tons of CO2 per year and uh, uh, person in Austria, but now we, we are down to 2.4. 2.4 tons, tons per CO2 per year per person. That's that is incredibly good. Yeah. That's a real model for everybody else to follow. Here in Ireland, we create 14 tons of CO2 emissions per person every year. Getting the local people involved and sharing the benefits is a key part of turning plans into action. Everyone, from hotels to schools and householders, benefit from cheaper heating, piped as hot water through the underground network of insulated pipes. They also have an energy learning centre to make sure that the next generation grows up appreciating the benefits of energy independence. Taking ownership has also reinforced pride in the area and create sustainable employment that will mean this generation will be able to live and work in the region. And are there indirect benefits by money being kept in the town, recirculating in the community, money that would have gone out and buying fuels? That's an interesting thing. 
more than 80,000 euros per day is running by fossil fuel out of the Geiltal Valley. And now we can do something with this money. So this is, I think, one of the, the, the best benefits we have. So we, have a, we are proud of something, we have money for something, and we can develop not only something for Kötzschach Mountain, but also for, a, for, a, for the surrounding. Local community energy initiatives in most EU countries are now well supported by their governments. The UN Earth Summit Agenda 21 put in place an action plan to encourage self-sufficiency by producing energy initiatives for local needs. Although covered by this international mandate, Ireland has so far only facilitated large wind farms and provides little support and many market barriers for micro-producers of electricity. Microgen could perform a badly needed role in creating resilience in local communities if they were allowed to share in producing their own electricity and to trade their excess power locally with the support of a cost-effective tariff. Irish state bodies still regard microgeneration as uneconomic and difficult to control. To get around this problem, MEGA, the Microelectricity Generation Association, has initiated a new smart cluster system and an independent power company, Empower, to manage this. I spoke to Martin Hogan. There's a real opportunity there for everybody that generates energy, whether it be PV, hydro, wind, anaerobic digestion, for example, to provide energy to sustain the needs of a local community. So we're trying to establish a smart cluster, a demonstration program with a few smart clusters around the country. One region could be here in Balting Glass, where we have wind, we have hydro, we have anaerobic digestion coming online, we have PV on the local supermarket. And we're interested in bringing all of those, meshing them together to provide for the needs of the local community. So we'll build a production line on one side and then we'll match that with a consumption line in terms of the local hospital, local industry. The aim there then is that that community will be a smart cluster which will provide for its own needs without interfering with the grid. Intermission has been a big problem with renewable energy sources and what we aim to do is set up a smart power company, Mpower, to allow for us to trade that power without interfering or without causing that intermission problem to the grid. So we'll have a virtual grid or a smart grid within a grid. Our Irish communities also have abundant natural resources and we've the potential to launch our own ground-up approach to energy independence. We have the demand. There are plenty of local communities who would like the opportunity to keep the money we spend on our energy circulating at home instead of going abroad on expensive and damaging fossil fuels. And now it seems we have the technology. Foreign investment projects have kept Irish entrepreneurs ahead of the competition, developing smart energy solutions for the international markets. But bottlenecks, red tape, and a lack of attractive feed-in tariffs for microgeneration have stalled progress here. Despite the barriers, local entrepreneurs in Bolton Glass feel they have the right mix to get a pilot scheme connected to the grid. What's specially happening here in Bolton Glass, Paul? Well, in Bolton Glass, within the community here, quite a lot of people have come together. We're looking at all sorts of different projects. We're looking at hydro, which we've got here in the river behind us. We're looking at biomass. We're looking at solar photovoltaic, wind. We've got a lot of electrical consumers in the town, big consumers, steady consumers, hospitals. We've got factories, pubs, restaurants, hotels, all looking at coming together to make it a smart grid, if you like. And this smart grid will produce electricity locally, consume it locally. The hope would be we're looking at a smart cluster. This is quite futuristic, but it's been done in other parts of Europe. Uh, we would like to do that here. We're hoping to pioneer that in the town. We have a very, very good grid system. That's an electric network within the town. We're hoping to set up a smart grid here locally in this community, which all of the people from the community can supply power into and sell and swap power, etc. With the smart cluster, Bolton Glass could trade electricity locally. This would be the first major change in how we distribute power since our grid system was first set up. So what are the particular projects? Here's a very good example of one project we have here. This is the local supermarket, SuperValue. Uh, their project is going ahead with a, a solar electric uh, installation on the roof, as you can see the guys here in the background. They are going to put a system in that will basically power the fridges, the refrigeration, the lights, all here on site. This project has been put together and sized at the moment to take the particular base load of SuperValue. 
However, that can be extended at any time. Arthur Gillespie was an early adopter of renewable energy and knows the benefits. He'd be happy to invest more in microelectricity generation. If the pilot scheme succeeds, he'll be adding more photovoltaic panels to the roof of his supermarket. In the meantime, he will use his excess energy to recharge his electric van for deliveries. And what motivated you to get involved personally in this? I think I got tired of paying, paying the cost of oil. So in 2008, I decided I'd put up a, a turbine at home and the pellet boiler and the solar panels. And at this stage now, we're starting to, to pay off. So as a community here, as a retailer, if I can carry that through, and with the solar panels on the roof and electric van, I should be able to keep my costs under control. Bolton Glass, a typical Irish rural community with 5,000 people living in its vicinity, could keep six million euro in local circulation by increased energy efficiency and by swapping imports of oil, gas and coal with their own locally produced renewable energy. That in turn could potentially generate 200 new local jobs. These long-term jobs would range from retrofitting homes and other buildings to forestry, growing energy crops, producing renewable fuels for heat and electricity from biogas, wind farms and micropower. I talked to Martin Hogan about Mega's concept. So do you see this concept being mainstreamed all over the country? Well, I think so, Duncan. I, I think people, once, the, once this demonstration program happens, people will see the value of it. You know, with energy costs rising, uh, there's going to be a common sense element to subscribing to renewable energy and maybe auto producing yourself. So people, the price of PV is coming down, the price of oil is going up. There's an intersection there, it's going to happen. People are going to be more interested in providing renewable energy and using their own resources to provide the energy locally. At the moment, it's illegal for anyone generating their own electricity to sell power to other users. They can sell a small amount back to the grid, but the rate is so low that it's not economically viable. To solve this, Empower will form a smart cluster in Bolton Glass so they can buy and sell their energy on the local grid. Electricity can be generated from a mix of wind turbines, hydropower, PV or biogas, whatever is locally available. To get around the problem of low feed-in tariffs, Martin's Empower company can facilitate local communities to exchange power through their smart cluster. How is this pilot program an opportunity? Well, it's an opportunity for us to deliver um, local technology. We have 4ES who are providing the, the local PV power and wind power. Um, we've got uh, digesters that we're building locally. We've got smart controllers. and We can provide all of that on our demonstration program. That's all uh, Irish hardware. Um, we've got Irish software in terms of the academic and brain power that we have, the knowledge and the know-how that's been delivered in the UK at the moment, but we can deliver it here on this demonstration program. So we're ready to go. We have all of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. We just have to put them together and we need some glue in terms of support from the stakeholders. Smart internet control technology can balance supply and demand on the network. It compares your electricity consumption and production in real times and decides whether to store it, as in hot water and heating, or export it locally, depending on price. I visited Tim Cooper, the inventor of the Emma Smart Unit, about its role in smart cluster demonstrations. Well, the main problem small generators generators that have at the moment is trading their power. And to enable them to trade power, they have to have a supplier or a company that is a licensed electricity supplier who buy the power from them and who sell it to final customers. And ideally, he wants to buy power when it's cheap and not when it's expensive. So if he can control the load in his customers' houses or properties so that their demand occurs when the power is cheap, and that their demand falls off when the power is high, that makes, that's critically important to the economics of that particular arrangement. And I believe that that is fundamentally important or a key issue when it comes to setting up these trading facilities for the small generators. Rising fuel and energy costs are putting financial pressure on Irish homes and businesses. Microelectricity generation has the potential to reduce business costs and our massive annual imports of fossil fuels. It can also generate additional income for many thousands of farm and other businesses across the country. At his mushroom farm, I talked to Leslie Codd. 
So what's the benefits of a business like yours in trading in local green energy? Uh, it would be hugely beneficial for my uh, for insulating me against the highs and lows of energy costs in the future and it would also possibly give me an extra income stream uh, if I could uh, get an income from supplying out to other users of electricity and hence I would be able to reinvest that back into our business and create more local jobs. Uh, it would absolutely be very helpful for us. And at the moment you've got a wind, big wind turbine there. Yes. What percentage of your power is that doing? Uh, it's doing between 30 and 40 percent of our power at the moment but we would gladly build more uh, wind turbines on site here to be able to supply more to our own farm and to, to export it as well if that ever came about. And at the moment are you restricted in doing that? Well we do export back but um, the amount that we get paid for it is so small that there's no incentive to uh, build more turbines. Generating, sharing and trading in smart energy within the community is a new concept for microelectricity generation and a grassroots bottom-up approach for communities. So what do you want to happen here, Paul? Well, here in Bolton Lass, the community itself wants this to happen. So basically, they've come together as a group, and the hope is that we would make our own smart grid here, that we would take control of this, and we would, from the bottom up, if you like, we would produce our own electricity, use our own electricity, and the nice thing about that is the technology is now here to do that. We've got smart internet protocol, we've got smart meters, we've got a new power generation company that is now empowered to buy electricity, and that has got a certain amount of recognition at the moment. So really we need to get, get driving that, and our appeal is to the players within the Department of Energy, etc., to give this a push. This can happen, the people of the community want it to happen, but it just needs to be pushed on. In recent years, Europe has embraced microgeneration and made it happen by easy connections to the grid and economically viable with attractive feed-in tariffs. These countries recognise the social, environmental and economic benefits offered to local communities. But Ireland's state bodies have been slow to realise and grasp the benefits offered by supporting micropower. So by embracing smart clusters now, we could make our local communities more resilient. This week I'm in one of our most spectacular and cherished counties, County Clare. I'm here on a mission to define ecotourism and see how the people of Clare are making it work for them and for the environment. This is O'Brien's Tower. It was built in 1835 as a viewing point for the tourists who were, even then, flocking to the Cliffs of Moher. And the cliffs are still a huge attraction, up to a million visitors a year. The short definition of ecotourism is nature travel that advances conservation and sustainable development efforts. Fair enough. There are seven essential principles that make up an ecotourism experience. I'm going to see how some of them are being applied here in County Clare, particularly in and around the Burren. Catherine Webster is director of the Cliffs of Moher Visitor Experience. How does she welcome a million people into this environment and conserve it at the same time? Well, we take that obligation to protect the environment here at the Cliffs Moor very, very seriously. Um, it is, after all, what people are coming to see. They're coming to see the natural heritage. So the cliffs are naturally eroding as part of this sort of natural process, the wind and the rain and the waves against them. But that was being exacerbated by the number of people going right out to the edge. So by putting up the walls and, and asking people not to cross them, that basically has helped reduce that increase in the erosion process. Do you think that all the measures that are being taken now are actually making a big difference? Well, we know they are because we do bird counts on a regular basis and we've seen the bird numbers that had been decreasing during the 90s and the early 2000s are actually increasing again in certain species. To preserve the cliffs, a number of measures are in place, including the use of renewable energy, minimising and managing waste, reseeding grass habitats and managing visitor flow to discourage people from entering protected areas. And what we're hoping is the environment will be protected for people so that they can continue to come into the future. The Burren and the Cliffs of Moher have just been declared a UNESCO Global Geopark. Local man Peter Curtin took me out on a walk near Doolan and told me about the Burren Ecotourism Network, a grouping of locals providing everything from painting holidays to outdoor adventure experiences. 
Businesses in the network have gone through a training and assessment programme to be certified as an Ecotourism Ireland accredited ecotourism destination. It's essential that we take care of the burn and the landscape and, you know, the burn is about nature but it's also about people and it's also about vibrancy and it's about people having, earning a good living in the burn. And is it working, do you feel? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Anywhere that has ecotourism, people are, are flocking to the places. Obviously, hopefully not too many people, you know, because you have to protect the environment. But, but yeah, it's working very well. This is the Bog Hill Centre at Kilfenora. It's advertised as the perfect place to relax and unwind. Eco-responsible relaxing is definitely something I can handle. <laughs> I guess I'll have to rejig my definition of relaxation. Uh, Carrie, why are we jumping up and down on Brook and Straw? Well, this is cup building. This is uh, an ancient building material. There's an abundance of clay, and this is mixed with straw and uh, an aggregate. We use recycled glass and sand. This is the preliminary to, to building something like this here. Ah. Carrie, what else do you guys do here besides hijacking tourists? <laughs> well, we're uh, an eco venue. We host uh, all sorts of workshops and training courses. We put on activity holidays. We try and, and run the whole place, making minimal impact on the, on the earth. The centre has a strong commitment to promoting local culture, holding music and dance workshops and courses for all ages, and taking visitors out to events in the community. You might have noticed it's been a bit wet, but the great thing about the burn is if it's raining up there, you can go underground. Over the ages, the action of water on the burn limestone has carved out a huge network of spectacular cave systems. Two of the easiest and most rewarding to visit are the Doolan Cave, with its impressive stalactite, and the Alwy Cave, with its underground waterfall. This is Kathleen Canole. She runs Burn Fine Wine and Food. She also gives cycling tours in the mornings to tourists. So we're off, Kathleen. Yeah, sure. Away we go. Kathleen's local knowledge adds an unusual personal touch to her guided cycling tours. You can learn a lot in three hours on the road. You're just coming up to Glen and Sheen, where you have the wedge tombs. Such a nice feeling. Kathleen, do you not have enough to do running a busy restaurant? I mean, why do you have to bring bicycles into it? I suppose really because I love to cycle and I love the early morning, the peace and the quiet and it's just lovely being out. Do you think it's important to have personal contact with the visitors? Oh yes, it's such a special place, Tanya, I think, and there are so many hidden gems that it's uh, very important uh, to have the local interaction and to get on the inside track and to know exactly where to go and see. The Burren offers surprisingly varied ways to experience a more personal contact with nature. This is the Bird of Prey Centre at the Elwy Cave. How old is he? This guy's four. And what age was he when he came here? Uh, about 16 weeks. So oh. that's when he would have been fully grown. They grow at an incredible rate when they're young, you know. That's, that's all they do is feed and grow. Wow. That's you. His feet are incredible. Well, thank you very much, but I wish I could take you home with me, but I know I can't. Part of County Clare VEC, the Burren Outdoor Education Centre offers active outdoor educational adventures to all age groups. Sea kayaking, rock climbing and caving are just the first few on the list. This is Joanna McInerney from the Burren Outdoor Education Centre and she's taken me over here. We're very keen for people to understand what it is about the burn that's unique because it's one of the only places here in Ireland where the limestone is above ground. So we would explain to people what the different formations are, what's the natural history behind it. What I enjoy most of all is, is seeing people's reactions to it, how, they, how much they enjoy it, but also how much they understand a living landscape. Woo! Yay, well done. How was that? Felt surprisingly good. The Burn Ecotourism website lists an extra principle Number eight, ensuring visitor satisfaction. I think they have that nailed. 
Oh, this is mad! 